You are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. You are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Sing it out one more time, Hosanna. And Hosanna, Hosanna, you 
So call upon his name, he is mighty to save, this is our God. Father to the to the broken this is our God he brings peace to our madness and comfort in our sadness this is our God so call upon his name he is mighty to save this is the one we have waited for. This is the one we have waited for. This is the one we have waited for. Fountain for the thirsty, lover for the lonely. This is our God. He brings glory to the humble, the crowns for the faithful. This is our God. So call upon. You. 
When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's a work that will bless your heart and I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within the way things appear your It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. <laughs> Welcome to Vinnie Church. 
Medieval Church, we like to get together to study the Word of God, to kind of get a handle on what God wants us to know about what's going on in life, because sometimes we get distracted by life about things that are in our life. We get kind of like caught up in the world, you know, looks good, sounds good, hmm, might be good for me. But then again, we also get caught up in family. Hmm, I don't know about that. Or we get caught up in our own intellect, or our own intelligence, our own morality, our own sensuality, our own, whoa, don't say it, sexuality. A lot of things we get caught up in, not because we started off that way, but because we looked at it. Hmm, looks good, sounds good, might even taste good. But in the long run, it doesn't always work out for the good. God says in his word that all things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. Now, on the one hand, I can tell you that no matter what you're going through, it's going to work out for good. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean you're going to enjoy the process of getting to the part where it says it's good. When you die, it will be good. So the scripture just by itself doesn't really apply to using it out of context because the bottom line is God can cause all things to work together for good according to his way of thinking, not your way. Because the bottom line is in the Bible, we're told that his thoughts are not our thoughts, neither are his ways our ways. So I would advise you by the Spirit of God to examine sometimes your own ideas and see if they aren't your own ideas or someone else's theology or meology or idea about God as opposed to what God is saying to you. One of the things we like to do at Vivo Church is to emphasize sharing Jesus in a personal and intimate way, meaning that I'll relate to you what I've experienced in my life because God has spoken to me, Jesus has spoken to me, he's revealed things to me, he's taught me things. I was saved in the Jesus movement. I've experienced lots of sin, lots of forgiveness, lots of mercy, lots of grace. And I like to demonstrate that God still loves you through his mercy and through his grace because of what he's done in me. Because, he's, because of what he's doing with me and because of what he's done for me. Now, I'm no perfect example, and if you want to follow someone, I don't say, follow thou me, but I will tell you, follow Jesus. Because he is the one who began a good work in me, and he's the one who started this journey of faith in you. If you're seeking to follow any other person, whether an Old Testament saint or a New Testament hero, or maybe your football legend, or your latest basketball hero, you're probably going to find great disappointment. You can't be anything more than what God made you to be. You are accomplishing, whether you understand it or not, God's purpose in your life, one way or another. So, if we choose to have a blessed life, we have to do something that Chuck Smith, a Bible teacher from the Jesus movement, once said. We should stay under the spout where the blessings come out. Now, sometimes when I say that, people kind of go off on a, on a, uh, a Joel Osteen routine and just says, Hey, man, as long as I'm blessed, you know, I'm at rest. <laughs> well, you know, it's nice to say that your gospel is about only being and getting good stuff from God. But I'd be lying to you if I didn't say there's a cross to bear. I'd be lying to you if I didn't say there are thorns in the rose bush. I'd be lying to you if I didn't say that growing up means sometimes standing up and acting like an adult as opposed to a baby with the thumb in its mouth. Sometimes you have to learn more in order to earn more of that blessing that God is giving you freely. 
wait a minute, you just said it was freely and I have to earn it? Well, yeah. Because <laughs> James says faith without works is dead, baby, and if you ain't earning it, guess what? Your wages that you're earning one way or the other of sin is death. And wages of the gift of God is eternal life, and rewards of that blessing that comes in eternal life isn't just, you know, like, oh, well, I get to live forever, so guess what? Now I'm, what am I going to do with that? There's other things that are going to occur that you'll be blessed for doing with God, for God, by God, and in God. Now, a lot of people have done things in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of religion, in the name of Christianity. And we see throughout history how those things have, you know, sometimes worked out, so-so. Sometimes been good, sometimes been bad. A lot of, quote, born-again Christians want to reinvent America into some kind of Christian nation when it really was a nation of Christians of some type. Some were Christians, some were not. The Constitution is not a Christian document. It is a document written by Christians. It's a very fine line that people want sometimes because they get into patriotism as an idea and then want to make it a religion. Sorry, Jesus didn't go there. You see, God so loved the world, not America, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in Jesus should not perish but have everlasting life. That doesn't mean they would not. It means they should not, and it means they could not if they choose to follow Jesus. That doesn't mean that we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, or does it? It doesn't mean that we have to do some kind of works trip. Hmm. It doesn't mean that we have to, like, pretend that we're walking this fine line between works and salvation and grace and mercy and kind of doing one of these things where we're kind of, like, confusing everything and going, Oh my God, what do I got to do in order to be saved? Well, you don't have to do anything, technically. But in order to enjoy the blessings that God has for you, you might want to do something about your faith. Because faith without works is dead. And if there's not some kind of change going on, if you're not being kind of like faithful to what you say you wanted when you got saved, then the question comes up about whether you are saved or were saved. And it isn't because you have to kind of like, you know, invent some way to prove you're saved. No, you just simply have to listen and obey. Because the Bible puts it that bluntly, to obey is better than sacrifice. You don't have to make yourself work out something, you know, like sweat and labor and, oh my God, it's so hard. Whew. But then again, you do have to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus. So. How do we balance these things that sound so contradictory? Now that's the beauty of it. That's why at Vidivo here, we talk about that personal relationship with Jesus. You may have this great doctrine of faith that you believe in. You may have this great statement that you said, ooh, I like that, that's for me. Whoa, look at that, I, you know, the Apostles' Creed, whoa. Whoa, look at that, the Nicene Creed. Whoa, look at that, we got another creed. We got, I promise to tell, I swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, help me God. I pledge of allegiance to the flag. You may have lots of like things you swear by. Maybe you shouldn't, <laughs> uh, you know. Because what Jesus came and did by revealing to us his life was that he contradicted in some ways, the law. Now, you couldn't say he broke the law, but you could say, technically, in some ways, he broke the law. Now, he broke the way that people understood the law to be, but he did not break the law according to what he said the law was meant to be, because he was the lawgiver. So, in some ways, when they said, you know, well, you can't do any work on the Sabbath, it's true. He broke the traditions of the law, but he didn't break the law because he fulfilled the law in doing what the law was supposed to accomplish, rest. Because the purpose of what the law was given was accomplished by what he did on those days that supposedly he broke the Sabbath or he broke the law. And so it's interesting that when you look at Jesus' life, you see something uniquely different about the way he's looking at religion and the way he's looking at his own denomination, Judaism, 
and the way that he's saying, I say unto you. Now, if I had someone come along, you know, being Jewish, and he said, I say unto you, I'd say, well, so who are you? Well, Jesus said who he was. I am, and I am from he who has sent me, and my Father has sent me, and I'm telling you who he is, that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So where did you come from, heaven? Oh, oh, well, hmm. In other words, we have to look at what Jesus said as being completely insane, which is why a lot of born-again evangelical Christians don't want to talk about what Jesus said. They want to change it to a way to make it fit modern times so that you don't have to wrestle with what Jesus said that's going to, put it bluntly, look a lot harder to do than it appears, doesn't it? Because you see, Jesus said weird things, you know, that either made him like, you know, off the wall or coming up with something worse than what the law said. And the law said that, oh, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, gotta be that, gotta look like this, gotta look like that. And then Jesus says, you can't even look, think, act, inside you're guilty. <gasps> you know, and quite frankly, we are, and you know it. You know that the things Jesus said about what's going on inside your heart are true. You know what's being said about your mouth is true. You know that even your actions, no matter how much you try to put on a show, it just doesn't go with what reality is in your life. You know you're a sinner. And that's a fact of matter for every Christian. Whenever a Christian strays off of admitting they're a sinner, they are in sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the way that it's written, it doesn't mean that all have sinned in the past. It doesn't mean all have sinned in the present. It means all are continually sinning and fallen short of the glory of God. That no one ever is not sinning. They are failing in some way from this level, that level, that level. No, from perfection. From hitting the mark. From being that with which God intended. Now, there is a way of being perfect. Really? Now, how can you do that? For God's sake, so God says, look, you're perfect. Well, no, I'm not. Well, in my eyes, you are. Because I want you with your flaws, as you are, the way you are, to be flawed. Yes, in sin, but I will use that and show you how I can use that which is crooked and make it straight. Because I'm imputing to you righteousness. I'm saying you're righteous. We know the truth. Yeah, come on now. So you owe me your life. Because I've given you my life, you owe me your life. So here I am, I'm making a deal with you. My name is Jesus, by the way, and I'm sharing with you a reality. Here's my life, I died for you. You want to give me your life? Hey, I'll give you my righteousness. But if you don't give me your life, you don't get my righteousness. You have to do one thing, you have to do the things I said. Well, what did you say, Jesus? That's the key. You see, Jesus didn't just simply leave it at, well, hey, you know, just take it and run. He said, look, follow the Son, the Son of Righteousness, the Son of God, the Son of Man. And Jesus demonstrated his love towards us by dying. God demonstrated his love towards the world by raising Jesus from the dead. The Spirit of God proved that it was possible to live according to what Jesus said by way of showing Jesus' life as he lived it. So we can follow Jesus, do what Jesus said, and accomplish his purposes as we follow and obey and listen to what God may say to us today. Now that's really what it boils down to, Christianity in a nutshell. Whatever you hear, you do. If God speaks to you, you do what he says. If God hasn't spoken to you, you're only accountable for what you know. And, you know, I mean, it's written in the Bible. So on the one hand, you could play the game that a lot of religious Christians are doing today and a lot of fundamentalist Christians and evangelical Christians and even, you know, a lot of Calvary Christians or Calvary Chapel Christians or Baptist Christians or Roman Catholic Christians or whatever Christians you want to call yourself 
are playing a game by reading and saying, well, the Bible says, so I can go from here, you know, and I'm, hey, I'm a Paul lean, uh, according to a Romans kind of Christian. Well, that's nice for you. That'll work in Paul's Roman, Pauline Roman theology, wherever that is. Well, I'm kind of like, you know, I don't go with Paul, but I go with Peter, you know, and I'm kind of like, you know, into this, you know, like Acts thing. Well, you know, it works for Acts, but I don't know where Acts is. Have you shown me where on the location of heaven the book of Acts is? Because Jesus made an interesting comment and statement that we can't avoid and we cannot get around the volume of the book. Because he made it very clear that not one part of it would be removed, not one part would be put back in. In other words, you can't do like kind of like the apocrypha in, apocrypha out. Which is it is, which is it out? You know, what's it all about? Well, you know, you don't have to fight those battles. What you have and what you know is where you go. And what God wants to do is cause you to flow with what he's causing you to know. In other words, flowing is like a river. It just kind of keeps going. You know, and as long as you keep going closer to God, then you're flowing with the river of life, so to speak. So really, a lot of those things that Jesus said make perfect sense when you continue on instead of sit on what was said as opposed to what he's saying. Because if you treat it as though he's saying it to you today, then you know he's alive and he's living in you and he's trying to cause something to happen in you. Whatever part you're focused in on, you're focused in on. Whatever part you're noticing, you're noticing. Whatever you hear, you hear. That's what it means when it says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God says. It doesn't make it some kind of spiritual, oh, I got to get the Holy Spirit. Oh, I got to get, you know, better ears. Oh, I got to get the spiritual ears. No. If God decides to speak, E.F. Hutton listens, or everybody else, you know, as the commercial used to say. If God spoke from the heavens now, you might hear thunder because you're not paying attention, but other people might hear God speak. And it could happen. He might be saying, come up hither and boom, we're out of here, some of us. Not saying everyone. Sorry. If you're kind of one of those, every single Christian in the world gets raptured, you don't know the Bible. You don't. Jesus said no, not even. Because even the disciples said, well, you know, what Peter was kind of like even talking about that. Well, what about him? You know, you said before that, you know, some people aren't going to die. I want to know who's going to get raptured. That's what Peter was asking. Peter wanted to know who goes in the rapture. He says, look, what about him? Hey, you know, I mean, he's the, the beloved one. <laughs> you know, yeah, right. You know, <laughs> that little wimp, you know, that's always hanging on your lap. I mean, come on. He's a little lap dog. You know, I mean, he's a wimpy guy, you know. That John, you know, who, well, that John, you know, I want to know, really, I, I'm the fisherman here, you know, I used to be a drunk, you know, and I got out of alcoholism. I used to be fishing, you know, and I got out of, you know, kind of like, you know, working with being pissed off at all those tax collectors and the government. You know, I finally got out of all that, you know, now I'm following you, Jesus, and yeah, I denied you, but I want to know about him. Who's going in a rapture? Well, Jesus said, do you love me? You know, and Peter said, well, yeah, you know, I like you. You know, Peter got into the love light kind of stupid thing that Christians do. And, you know, he played the love light thing, you know, and it didn't work. And finally he says, okay, fine, I get it. I'll feed your sheep. And so he tried to. I think he did okay, but I'd say Paul probably was used a little more if we look at what's written today. Might have understood it a little better. Maybe not, maybe so. Maybe Peter was good for the Jews because he frustrated those that were in charge by being so, ooh, Peter, smelly. But John, hey, rapture city, man. I mean, the dude was tripping out into heaven. He went into seeing that which was going to be accomplished and fulfilled in the book of Revelation and recorded it for us. Now, that's interesting that John was raptured. I mean, enraptured, if you want to say it that way, because he was either in the spirit or on the Spirit in the Lord's Day, or on the Lord's Day, or unto the Lord's Day. It doesn't matter how you look at it. Either way, he was E-N-R-A-P-T-U-R-E-D. And if you know what that means, then you understand that, yeah, of course he was. If you don't understand it that way, then you can understand it in a way that we could say, well, by the Spirit of God, I'll tell you that he was raptured. But, you know, you just might not understand that yet.
So he was enraptured, E-N, instead of I-N. Little play on English, and you think only Jews know how to play with Jewish words? Ha! English can be played with in English words. So, knowing these things, that God revealed what he wanted, how he wanted, the way he wanted of that life that would be acceptable in his sight, we only have to look to Jesus to understand really the things that we should be doing in this life. Now, like I said, there's a lot of people that are going to get you into like, you know, hey, but what about Paul? Well, Paul said what Jesus told him to. But there's things that Paul wrote that Jesus didn't tell him to. Now, how do you know the difference? The Spirit of God tells you to. <laughs> You see, it's always going to be the Word of God by the Spirit of God to the people of God of the Son of God. Because if it isn't the Spirit of God making something fit for you, it doesn't fit. No matter how hard you try, I'm sorry, but you know what? If you're a Catholic and you want to stay in the Catholic Church, stay in the Catholic Church. Who cares? You're doing what God tells you to do, not what man. So if you feel perfectly content, and you are closer to Jesus by watching maybe, say, some other Bible study from some other church, and then you go back to the Catholic Mass and you worship, hey, that's fine. Nobody has a problem with that. God doesn't. I can tell you that in the name of Jesus. God does not have a problem with you going to a Catholic Mass. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, God probably would honor your truthfulness if you admit to yourself that you really like it. So you go. Or if you're a Protestant, you know, and you like your whichever, you know, whatever denomination of your Protestant faith that you grew up in and you like the old hymns, you know, and I know God knows that Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, when I was going there, used to, you know, sing an old hymn, and I used to go, yeah, pewee, because I hate organs. I don't like old hymns. And to this day, it's really a struggle for me, even when they rework them and remake them. Sometimes, you know, I kind of get into it a little bit, but I grew up on the scripture put into scripture, or the scripture put into music. And so all of my learning that I grew as a dynamic, memorized, born again Christian, as a Jesus freak, being memorizing the word, wasn't because I went out and memorized the word. I was singing it. I was singing these worship songs that were the word of God. Most of what I know from memorization was from worship songs we sang. <laughs> it was that simple. Nowadays, they're seeing a lot of feelings, feelings, you know, and it's like, well, okay, you know, I'm not going to knock this generation with what they're doing, you know, and where they're going. But, you know, when that guy got back into the heart of worship, I think he went back to the word, you know, but okay, you know, I mean, everybody's got their way of, you know, doing their thing, you know, and such as it is, whatever the spirit of God is leading you in, then go there. But you see, it's not a problem to be denominational. It's not a problem to be Hebrew roots, if you want to. I mean, if you're really into, you know, Hebraic type of celebration of the seven feasts, I'd say fine, you know. Don't go for Hanukkah, because it's kind of like Christmas. It's like, well, you can make it work, but it's made up. Just like Christmas is made up, so is Hanukkah. I'm sorry, but, you know. But of the seven, yeah, they're in the Bible. They're there. You know, no problem. Enjoy them. Don't get carried away on it. Don't make yourself out to be a legalistic Jew. If you do, guess what? You may go through the Great Tribulation. <laughs> You'll prove how much the law works. Whoa! <laughs> there you go. But my point being is this. It's always going to be personal, not corporal. In other words, there's a lot of people nowadays in these latter days that want to point the finger. They want to look at you and say, oh, you got to straighten up. You're screwed up. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm screwed up. If God tells me so, I'll go for it. <laughs> Sorry, you don't get to screw me up or unscrew me. I do. Woohoo! You see, you really can't help someone else. You can provide what helped you, but you can't help someone else unscrew what they screwed in. Or maybe what God has put in their life for a reason that you don't know. Because if you're not being led by the Spirit of God to speak to a person, and God knows there's lots of Christians that are out there that are going to screw you up by telling you, well, God told me to tell you. I don't think so. 
Because as soon as they tell me God told me, I'm going to say, well, the Spirit of God told me. <laughs> and they go, well, wait a minute. That's what I mean. You go, oh, okay. So the Spirit of God told you to tell me. Okay, well, I'm going to say the Holy Spirit now. Well, no, no, I mean the Holy Spirit. I like to play with them a little bit, you know, and have fun. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, I got my own personal relationship. I talk to God. God talks to me. I don't have a problem talking to you. You know, I mean, while I'm talking to you, I'm still talking to God. I mean, at the same time, you know, because I personally know that I have a personal relationship with God and that Jesus, being that he's my high priest, makes intercession for me. So at the same time, I'm kind of going, hey, Jesus, you know, can you whisper to this guy, tell him that, you know, you got me covered. Because, you know, if I don't, you know, woo, whoa. So you don't really have to, you know, like get all wrapped up in where you're going to church or how you're going to church or what you're doing with your relationship with God. But you do have to develop a relationship with God. You have to kind of like begin to ask him, you know, what do you read? You know, what are you doing with your life? What are you about? And if you can't read the Bible and get something out of it, don't read it. No offense, but, you know, I'll be honest with you. You know, I know people that have read the Bible, and my wife is one of them. My wife read the Bible one time through and got squat out of it. I was impressed. She read it through. I mean, God knows I used to. She's reading the Bible. She's reading the Bible. She's reading the Bible? I ought to read the Bible. <laughs> now, I know some of you are going, you don't read the Bible? And they're like, ah, false teacher. No. I read the Bible because I'm studying the Bible constantly. I, you know, I'm 24-7, dude, you know, in the Bible. Just about. I mean, don't get me wrong. I take a break and I'll go watch movies, you know, and, even in the movies, I'm kind of thinking about God. You know, I see God in it. You know, I see kind of flesh and this and that, spirit and whatever. You know, I see God in everything. So for me, it's like I have a hard time not seeing God in things. But you may not see God in anything, but I'm a little different. You know, I'm kind of like mystic in some ways, but we won't go there for now. But my wife was reading the Bible, you know, and I've read the Bible at different times, gone through it. You know, I mean, you know, and have to do it, you know, kind of like, well, I know where it is. Boring, but no, I'm kidding. But for me, devotionals was the way, and so I read a lot of devotionals daily, and then I'd read lots of devotionals because I was interested in people's perspective and how they got to where they got to where they, how they got to where they got by what they got to and how they got there. So I was always interested in how the Spirit of God had led people because I was always wondering, why is it so different? Then I realized it's not. Then I realized where and how people make perception mistakes or err on scriptures or their foundations and then once I did God began to use me in ministry I can't say I'm always doing the right way of it but I do know where they err or how they are now how that applies to them sometimes it's direct confrontational you know sometimes it's indirect confrontational sometimes it's care confrontation Sometimes it's just communication by way of circumferential, you know, um, logic, bringing them a roundabout, circular way of thinking so that they can reason it out for themselves. Sometimes it's providing them tools. Sometimes it's just saying, no, <laughs> not, <laughs> false, error, no, uh-uh, eh, eh, mm. <laughs> you know, oh well. But lately God has allowed me to not be so much so in that because in these latter days, <sighs> Can I tell you the truth? People are screwing up and people are going off on tangents and people are wrong, especially about violence, especially about guns, especially about Jesus on his stand on, you know, war. You won't find Jesus get drafted in any war. You won't find Jesus get drafted, as a matter of fact, volunteer to go serve in any military. If he had, We'd be dead because we would not have salvation. So I got news for you. There's a lot of error out there now that really has been allowed to go on that you won't get the truth from your pastor, per se. You can get it from God. And, you know, it doesn't mean your pastor is false. Your pastor is like a kind of like a hireling. You know what I mean? God hired him in order to, you know, take care of you and, you know, you know how parents are, you know, parents want to take care of you, so they do the best they can. You know, they'll say, curfew, 10 o'clock, you know, and you come home at 11, guess what? 
busted, you know, and you're put on, you're grounded for a while until you learn to obey or whatever. Well, you know, that's kind of what pastors do. They, you know, they don't, they don't have control per se of you, you know, and they don't want to be that controlling, but they do the same thing and they'll say it that way by the pulpit. And in some ways, you know, presented it that way by way of, you know, oh, oh, oh. but really it doesn't work that way. The way God does it is that you reap what you sow and he's saying, look, your bad stuff that came upon you, you did. I said, this is the way you should go walk in it. You said, no, I'll go that way. And guess what? You stepped in the mud puddle. I said, here's the sidewalk. There's the street. Hit the door, Jack. You know, and you walked outside the door. And guess what? Run over. Well, you know, I mean, you got to walk in God's way, the way he's telling you today. Chuck Smith, again, another, you know, famous quote from him that I know today a lot of, you know, second generation pastors, third generation pastors, fourth generation pastors don't remember or don't know and they don't practice it, but I do. You know, it's Chuck said when he was teaching on the Holy Spirit series that, hey, you know what? I'm not getting out of bed until I ask God what to do. If God wants me to get out of bed, I'm out of bed. But I'm not flying out that door, you know, heading down the street, you know, thinking that I got to go to work just because I think I got to go to work. You see, walking in the spirit means that you have to deal with God as though he is alive. Oh, he is. You didn't know that? If every bird in the air and every sparrow has fallen to the ground and he knows it, then I think he's involved in every single part of your life because he said every hair on your head, he knows that too. I guess that means God is real and God is not dead. Now you may have a problem with that. You may have to prove that. I spent the first 20 years of my life bluntly proving God is real. Now, you may not like one of the ways I did it because I've heard Greg Laurie teach against it. I used the shotgun effect, you know, Right here, here's a Bible. You have a problem. You want to know if God speaks? You want to know if God speaks? I'll tell you God speaks. God, you speak to them. I don't care. I'll look like an idiot. You show them there what they want to know. And sure enough, I'd hand you a Bible and say, you pray about something right now. You you do it. You know, you get your act together. You know, you, you want to know if God's real? Fine. Let's prove it right now. You don't got the guts, I got the guts. You don't got the spirit, I got the spirit. Let's prove right now that God is real, that he's going to talk to you. And I'd be mad about it. Oh, I'd be fired up. I'd be pissed off. And I'd be scared in my booties because God put me in that position and it was like time to confront this person. Like, And so I would. And I'd say, look, here's a Bible. You don't think God speaks? Fine. You think, you know, what's the biggest thing in your life right now? You think about it right now and here. Take it. Flip it open anywhere. I'll bet you God speaks. And you'll know it and you will believe it and I'll prove to it. You blah, blah, blah. And so I'd hand on the Bible, you know, they'd go... Find her or shut you up, you stupid Jesus freak, you know. You know, and then they'd read it. And you'd watch their face. It would just it was like, you know, their their brows are furled and they'd go. You know, and they I said, Well, do you speak to you? Yeah. Okay. So I went on, and I leave. I leave it alone, let it go, whatever. God knows out of all those hundreds, maybe not hundreds, but a lot of people that in those days that I had to do that with, that God, God sending me, not meaning that everybody can do that, because it's not a program. It's not a, a thing that you can put into play. It's something that God tells you to do that day. And so when God told me to do it those days that I did, and most of the times it was in Oregon where there was a lot of spiritual warfare going on, a lot of false teaching, a lot of weird stuff, and even, you know, witchcraft and bestiality and, you know, I mean, real genuine witchcraft, not kind of like phony stuff that people play with nowadays, you know, you know, the kind of like Wiccan stuff, you know. But anyways, um, you know, I mean, real stuff. But, you know, the point being is this, that, you know, whenever they did, they would always, you know, have to, they would be shocked and they would admit it. Then later, they would come back and argue and fight about it. They'd say, no, that was just coincidence. Okay. And I'd be, they'd be mad at me because I, I, you know, they got whatever answer they wanted. Sometimes I'd ask them, well, what did you pray? And they'd tell me. And then I'd say, well, what did you read? And I'd, they'd read it and I'd go, whoa, sure glad I wasn't the one involved. You know what I mean? It's like, 
because it was God made certain in no uncertain terms that he was speaking to them. I mean, it was connected up. My wife has learned that lesson the hard way. I, a lot of times, too. Because, I mean, there's been a lot of times where we prayed and God has spoken to her in feelings. A lot of times we prayed together. I mean, over the years, you know, we've been married about, oh, I don't know, eight to ten years, you know. And so we haven't been married that long, you know. And so the point being is as she's grown, she wasn't saved when I met her, you know. And she got saved, you know. And so as she got saved, she grew. And I, she grew on her own, you know. And then different times when we'd come into conflict. Because if you've ever been remarried, then you have baggage and you're going to run into conflicts, you know. And if you're an older Christian, you know how to carry baggage. You become a luggage carrier because you've done it in the ministry for years. So you learn to do it with your spouse. No problem. It may drive them crazy, but, you know, you learn how to deal with it. And you just kind of like, mm, it's okay. It'll happen. Just give it time. You know. And sometimes you have to wait if you're remarried. You have to wait on your marriage to be that place where you can at least rest somewhat. But if you're older in the Lord, then, you know, you're always going to be accountable and responsible to God. And you'll be accountable for every marriage you've ever been in. They may not always be the way God calls them marriages. There may be one that he calls a covenant. The rest were marriages you made, you know, <laughs> kind of like what Abraham did. You know, you made it. Hey, you live with it. <laughs> yeah, we got Arabs and Jews fighting it out today because of what Abraham did <laughs> and Sarah. And that's kind of what happens in Christianity a lot today. You know, people don't know how to deal with the divorce question because they don't know how to deal with divorce. You made it. You deal with it. You got to, you know, go on with it. But guess what? It doesn't mean that, you know, you're, uh, you can't work in ministry. It doesn't mean that you can't be saved. It doesn't mean that you can't accomplish God's purpose. It doesn't mean it isn't God's will in some way to still bless both parts, even as he did to Hagar and to Sarah. He blessed them both. One was chosen. One was according to the flesh, but one was chosen for the promise to be accomplished. So, you know, I mean, I'm just telling you as an encouragement for some of you that have been divorced, maybe even more than once. Let the hear, hear. But my point is this. God knows. God knows your heart. God knows if you were and if you were the guilty party, God forgave you. Guess what? Move on. Or go back and fix it and reconcile and move on. It's not about the marriage that God is trying to save. He saves souls, not marriages. Sorry. Saves children, not families. He saves people, not nations. He saves those individuals. That's why Jesus is personal. And then by saving those, he does save nations and families and homes and houses and relatives and neighbors and friends and all the other good things that come along. But it's about the one, one-on-one -on -one with God, because that's how you're going to stand in judgment, one-on-one. -on -one. So having said all that, it's kind of like it's interesting that God wants to deal personally, privately with you. He wants you to use those things that are around you, pastors and churches and teachers and doctrines and the internet and Bibles and devotionals and all these tools, the fresh air, the sun that he provided, the moon, the stars, the very day that you were born, the day that you live in today, this is the day that the Lord has made. He wants to use all those to reveal how much he loves you, but also that he has you in the palm of his hand, and he's trying to tell you something. And that's what you need to do, is you need to listen to what he's trying to tell you. And you need to go after it with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with everything you've got, you need to go after that to find out what God has in store for you. So let's look at the word now as we've discussed all about all the different ways with which Christianity has been portrayed about being distant sometimes from God, being removed from God, being in the word only God, being the shotgun effect from God, being this kind of God, that kind of God, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, God of the Baptists, God of the Catholics, God of the Calvary Chapelites, God of the Vineyardites, God of the Hittites, God of the Hivites, God of the Shivites, God of the whoever knows, <laughs> but they're gods. Uh, but, you know, the Lord, our Father of Jesus, the God who made us and created us. So let's hear what he has to say, and let's examine maybe something that he might want us to learn from and to apply in our life today as we choose to use those things that are appropriate 
not because we think they fit, but because God takes the Word of God by the Spirit of God to the people of God, of the Son of God. And that's what we want you to see in this today, because it's very important to realize that here's what the Lord might say if he were traveling in your neighborhood right now today. The kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods to every man according to his several ability. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey? All these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. The manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit withal. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Unto whomsoever much is given, of him much shall be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him shall they ask the more. Who is sufficient for these things? Who can do all these things? I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. You know, it's great because it says in there that as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The manifold grace of God is what we are stewards of, being servants of, being the ones who give of that which we received of. And that's kind of what God wants to demonstrate to us by what Jesus did for us. He went to everyone and to everyone he did speak. Now, you may try to pretend like you could get away with condemning, say, a Mormon or a president of the United States or a gay Christian or a homosexual married person or a same-sex marriage person or a person who's had an abortion or commits an abortion or the doctor who did it. You may think you can condemn all kinds of people. You can't. Judge not, lest you be judged. That's pretty simple. It just means don't judge, judge not. The word judge not is very clear in Hebrew. It's very clear in Greek, judge not. If I said don't judge, it's very clear in English what I'm saying, don't judge. Because if you judge, you'll be judged by that. That's how simple it is, don't judge. But you gotta judge, no you don't. You don't have to judge. You can ask God, well what's that mean? I can ask the judge, what's it mean? I can ask the police officer, according to judgment, what's that mean? I can ask a lawyer, what's that mean? I can ask other people, what's that mean? But I cannot judge, and I will not judge. And I'll tell you straight up, I will not judge, period. Because if I do, then guess what happens to me? I'm judged by that same judgment. I'm going to give mercy. I'm going to give grace. I don't have to have or make judgment in order to give grace. I don't have to judge or make judgment in order to give mercy. I don't have to judge or make a judgment in order to extend the loving kindness of God. I don't have to do anything at all in regards to judging in order to do what God said to do. But one thing I can do in obeying Jesus, I can judge not. Because of that servant of the commonwealth of grace or the com commonwealth? Is it commonwealth? No, I already forgot what it was, the word. Manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man proper with all other men of the seed of the Spirit. Manifold. Of the manifold, just like a manifold is that which is on a car, you know, and it kind of focuses everything back into directly putting it back down into the, the, uh, takes the air mixture and the gas mixture, injects the gas into the air. The manifold, you know, receives it and puts it back down into the valves, or the valves open up so that it goes down through the valves, down into the, the cylinder so that the pistons that are coming up can compress it and then it can be fired off so that it can accomplish the purpose that God wanted to make an engine out of it. Well, the manifold, manifold grace that you've been given or the manif manifold grace that God wants you to be stewards of is that with which he wants you to dispense it all around. That means everyone you found. You don't have to judge anyone. Hey, Grace, hey, grace, hey, grace, hey, grace, 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 grace. Grace and peace is what Paul used to say. The reason being, that's what Paul is saying. And that's what Jesus wants us to do.
because he's already died for you and he died for them and he died for the enemy you don't like and he died for those that are abusing you and using you and confusing you so if he's already died for them too then it's grace that we must give it's grace and mercy we must extend it's loving kindness because God will change that person through the grace you give it's grace for grace, and by grace are you saved, and that not of yourself. It was a free gift from God. And it's not because it's a free gift that we call it grace, or it's something that you could not do that God did for you because you could not do it for yourself. No, it's grace because God said, look, I will wipe you out, period. Dude, take the grace and run with it. Now give it everywhere you go. That's what you're called to do. Don't you know? Distributing to the necessity of the saints. David said, is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of my brethren, you have done it unto me. Whosoever shall give to drink of one of these least of the little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. To do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices God is well pleased. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. There's a common expression right now that says, oh, we don't want to take care of the entitled people. We don't want our tax dollars going to take care of that part of society. We don't want those people to get taken care of or provided for. We don't want any of that kind of nature to be part of our nature because, after all, we're Christians. We're not doing what Jesus said. We're doing what we want society to accomplish. Are we a welfare state? You betcha. You betcha. We are our brother's keeper. Always have been, always will be. If you haven't figured out that Jesus is a socialist in one way, that God wants to bless the poor, that God wants to heal the sick, that God wants to raise the dead, that God wants to provide for the naked, that God wants to take care of the hungry, that God wants to provide without question, and it says without question, those that are in need, I suggest to you, shut up about your tax dollars. Shut up about your money. Shut up about your will, your way, your thoughts about society today. Because if God causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the wicked and the good, and why he provides that for you so that you can be accomplishing his will, then what are you busy about trying to say it's your money? It's your job and it's your taxes. It never was and never will be. It's always been God who gave you life. It's always been God's money from the beginning. It will be God's money in the end. It will be God's job from the beginning until the end. It's not you. It is him. And until you figure that out, you're going to keep playing the game. What game? You know the game. I'm a Christian on Sunday. Wednesday night. Sunday night. Don't be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. If you don't work, you don't eat. We know you got to work for your food. It's not what it says. It's not what God said. God said he so cares, he hears their cries. And if you don't meet their need, whoa, whoa, oh, hmm. Where do you think God's going to look? If he doesn't look at you first. Well, my church, hey, we got a food pantry. You know, if somebody's in need, they can come to us. Yeah, all right. We are, we're open, you know, well, after a service, you know, or, you know, sometimes before the service, you know, or maybe sometimes during the week, you know. I mean, we got these big buildings, you know, that we use seven days a week, you know. Never mind, they're homeless. Let's see, we got this giant building that we worship God in, and we've got 
all these street panhandlers that we can't do anything with because we've got to shove them off in the street corners. After all, they don't get along with the program. They won't go with the program, so we're not going to deal with the program because we're not going to deal with them. Let's just shuffle them off and, you know, get the sweet people, you know, the good people, the Christians together in that big building. Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, I guess. But that's not what God's about. You see, even Jesus looked at the temple and he said, look, I know you like this. This isn't what my house is called. My house is called a house of prayer. This big building was not what I originally designed. I had originally designed a tabernacle and it traveled wherever the people were and it went from place to place and wherever God was that's where the tabernacle was and wherever the tabernacle was that's where God was now I want to put my spirit in you so that wherever you go God is and wherever God is he'll provide for the people and he will take care of the people he will love the people he will die for the people he will live for the people he will forgive the people he will give grace to the people he will give mercy to people because God is in you and you are the one that represents God me If not you, 